It's a pleasure to have uh, Bert Otaro giving his uh, fourth and last talk on the uh, Chao group of classifying spaces. Okay, this working? Um, yeah, I hope so. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, today I wanted to talk about uh, uh, <laughs> whether the question of uh, whether child groups of classifying spaces are finally generated abelian groups or not. Um, the answer is that, in a sense, in general, they're not. Um, so let's see. I can't quite tell, is my mic on? Uh, yeah. yeah, okay, thanks. Um, so for, uh, let's see, so there's this theorem um, from my uh, 2014 book, um, Group Cohomology and Classifying Spaces, um, um, which says that mm, the, the child ring of uh, the classifying space of a group is always sort of generated in finally many degrees. Um, so let's say like this for that fine uh, group scheme G over a field um, with um, a faithful representation uh, of dimension N. Um, so what can I? So it's always true that if you take um, the chow ring of the classifying space of this group uh, and divide out by the ideal generated by the churn classes of this representation. So as I sort of discussed, a representation of a group gives you a vector bundle on the classifying space, and that has churn classes in the chow ring on the classifying space. Um, then this is always uh, sort of small, or at least concentrated in finally many degrees. This is isomorphic to the chow ring of um, GLN mod G. Which is just, uh, so, so right, you know, this representation gives you an embedding of G into GLN, so this is just a finite dimensional uh, smooth variety, right? The picture is you have this um, sort of picture, is that you have this uh, um, vibration geometrically. Um, so, so, you know, VGLN is, is a contractible space divided out by GLN. If you only divide out by G, which is a subgroup of GLN, then obviously this quotient maps to that quotient, and the fiber is sort of obviously GLN mod G, just a finite dimensional algebraic variety. And um, essentially what I'm describing here is sort of the reason why this, this isomorphism is true. Um, in general, it's hard to understand the child, how child groups behave under a fibration, but this is a sort of easy situation in the sense that um, a structure group for this fibration is GLN. And all GLN bundles in algebraic geometry are Zariski locally trivial. So this is somehow not a very bad um, vibration. And you can, you can read off this statement. Um, right, so, uh, so like one way to read this is that it implies that the Chow ring of any group is always generated by the churn classes of any one faithful representation together with some classes in low degrees, right? Because this, um, it's a finite dimensional variety. It only has Chow groups in a finite number of degrees. Okay, so uh, a way to interpret that is that, you know, so chow star bg is a finally generated algebra over the integers um, if and only if for every individual degree it's a finally generated abelian group. Um, so that's the only issue. Because, um, yeah. So somehow the ring structure is kind of under control, but just additively, it's a bit uh, mysterious. Uh, I can give like a couple of examples where these things have been computed. So for example, um, Rebecca Field, who's here, uh, let's see, published 2012, showed that um, for any field K um, of characteristic not two, um, the chow ring of the split uh, group SO2N, I mean, uh, the odd orthogonal groups were easier to understand, but this case was kind of complicated. Um, this was generated by the churn classes of the churn classes um, of the standard uh, 2N dimensional representation of this group, uh, and together with one extra class, which is um, in cohomology, it maps to uh, a certain multiple of the Euler class. The, the Euler class itself is some interesting in cohomology class here that doesn't come from the Chow ring, but some multiple of it does. Uh, and let's see, we know the relations, all right, two, two times 
the odd term classes are zero because this representation is self-dual. The y class times the odd term classes is zero. And um, just like in topology, the, the square of the Euler class, if you know the cohomology of this thing, the square of the Euler class is plus or minus a certain Pontryagin class. Um, yeah, likewise here, there's some relation. Yn squared equals uh, minus one to the m, <laughs> two to the two m. Oops, this is m, sorry. Uh, yeah, whatever. Um, excuse me. Mm, C two m. Okay. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, minus two. C two m. Okay. Mm. So this is sort of typical of the, a lot of the calculations that have been done in the sense that um, uh, sometimes you know the the Chow ring of a group. If you imagine, if you want to ask yourself, how does it vary with the field? Um, sometimes it's different for very. <coughs> you get a weird answer for very small fields, but. <coughs> Typically, once the field like contains enough roots of unity, then these chow rings and examples uh, tend to stay the same. So, like that's what I'm saying. This is the, the same answer for all big enough fields. <coughs> um, okay, but somehow, yeah. What turns out is that in general, for you know weirder groups, uh, the chow ring sort of genuinely does depend on the field, and it can be and it can be fail to be finally generated. <coughs> okay. Oh, oh yeah, but I might ask those. So question, um, so for an algebraically closed field, um, is, um, is the shower, you know, or let's say, let's just talk about whether these groups are finally generated or not. Um, are the shower rings of, um, sorry, and, and, and G, an algebraic group over K, um, is the chow ring of this classifying space over an algebraically closed field always the finally generated abelian group? Um, so this is, I, you know, I would say basically this is completely open. Um, all the examples where we can compute these groups, um, they are finally generated abelian groups. Um, but yeah, in general, we just don't know. But what I'm going to um, describe is that for fields that are not algebraically closed, um, this is not always true. Um, admittedly, you have to consider fields that are rather weird and complicated, but nonetheless, uh, okay. All right. All right, so what do I do this? Okay. So, um, all right. So there's some um, general machinery that I'm going to use for this, and this is sort of my result, but, um, but uh, 2016, but building on um, Lots of earlier results um, by Block, Mercuriev, uh, Janssen, and others. Um, so essentially, yeah, I mean, um, how do I want to see this? Uh, I want to talk about a, a general sort of trick in studying child groups called uh, decomposition of the diagonal. Um, basically, yeah, this is a way of sort of relating different kinds of information. Um, about a variety. Like sometimes you can say th 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 this technique, which I'll try to describe, sort of tells you sometimes if, if the Chow groups are complicated, then the unramified cohomology has to be complicated, or vice versa. Um, and and I'll, I'll need that kind of argument to, uh, to address this question for, for fields that are not algebraically closed. <coughs> okay, so uh, I'll state this in terms of a smooth compact variety. Um, over a field. Um, this is sort of, and you have to do some work to get this to apply to showerings of classifying spaces because these things are defined as uh, showerings of certain non compact varieties. Like you take an open subset of vector space, divide by your group. Um, so basically, I'm going to apply this theorem eventually to smooth compactifications of those, um, of those quotient varieties. <coughs> okay, anyway, but let's see, in this situation, um, Let's see, I talk about and R just any non-zero commutative ring. Um, in my examples, I think this is going to be, uh, this is going to be like a coefficient ring. In my examples, it'll be FP, you know, for a prime number P. Um, um, oh, yeah, and then I need this notation that the, the Chow groups of a variety with coefficients in R just means the usual Chow groups, um, which are abelian groups, uh, tensored with R. <coughs> Somehow that's the only reasonable notion of coefficients for four child groups. <coughs> um, okay, so let's see. Then I want to say the following are equivalent. Uh, a whole bunch of 
properties of this smooth variety, which all sort of say that the Chow groups of this variety are kind of simple. Okay, so one is that um, for every field mm, um, f over k, I don't want to say this. Um, yeah, the homomorphism from the Chow group of zero cycles on x to the Chow group of zero cycles on x over this bigger field is surjective. Um, so uh, yeah, so uh, one of the basic <laughs> things you do in algebraic geometry is given a, a scheme over one field, you can produce a scheme over a bigger field. In terms of rings, this is tensoring a ring, a, a k-algebra over k with, with a bigger field f. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, and I didn't really say this, but there, but there is a pullback map. Uh, yeah, geometrically, this is a kind of flat pullback. Um, but yeah, anyway, just, just given some sub variety of x given by equations with coefficients in k, you can view that as a sub variety you know, with coefficients in, in f. <coughs> uh, anyway, so there is this homomorphism. It's not always uh, surjective. Maybe, maybe I should like give a sort of yeah, very simple example. So if I take, let's say, an elliptic curve um, over a field, um, smooth surjective curve of a genus 1, um, then the Chow group of zero cycles on E is isomorphic to the integers plus the group of points on E. So elliptic curves have this famous property that yeah, there's a group structure on the, the group of k rational points for any field. Uh, yeah, and so this is, this is the sort of variety where this condition will not be true because if I consider E over a bigger field, then um, you know, the group of sort of points on the elliptic curve will, will get bigger. Um, on the other hand, let's say for for P1, say, then the Chow groups of P1 over any field are just the integers, you know, so no matter what this field is, the Chow group stays the same. So the idea is that, like this, this property is, you know, kind of vaguely picking out varieties that are like P1, not like an elliptic curve. <coughs> okay, uh, oh yeah, yeah, okay, so that's one condition. The second condition, which is kind of pretty, is just that um, for every field containing this capital F containing little k, um, the degree homomorphism um, from child groups, child group with zero cycles on x over this bigger field to the integers, um, that is an isomorphism. I guess uh, maybe I didn't actually <laughs> you know, mention this notion of the degree of a zero cycle, but geometrically this is just push forward to a point, right? You have a morphism of schemes from, um, from x over a bigger field to spec of that field, and uh, this, is, this is proper, I'm assuming. And so, um, yeah, so this, what's called degree, is just proper push forward. A zero cycle here gives you a zero cycle here, and that's just an integer. <coughs> okay, uh, oh yeah, so but, al but already, right, just the fact that one and two are, are equivalent, I claim, is kind of nice. So it says that if you have any sort of uh, smooth projective variety where the child group of zero cycles doesn't get any bigger when you increase the field, then actually it had to be <laughs> just zero, I'm sorry, it just had to be z, the integers for your uh, original field and also for every bigger field. So somehow this is sort of like saying that the only kind of natural <laughs> choice for what the child group of zero cycles could be would be the integers. Anything else, if it's anything else, it's gonna kind of change when you increase the field. <coughs> okay, um, right. So. <laughs> There's uh, several more things that are equivalent to that. Uh, so the third thing is a condition considered by Prokhoriev that um, for every um, R linear cycle module in the sense of Rost um, uh, over, let's see, uh, over for schemes over K with coefficients in, yeah, I said R linear. Um, mm. The I want to say the unramified, basically, one way to think about cycle modules is they, they give you a notion of unramified cohomology. And what I want to say is that uh, these conditions one and two are equivalent to x having trivial unramified cohomology in, in the most general possible sense. So the homomorphism from uh, this invariant uh, m of my base field applied to mapping to um, m of this function field, the unramified. <laughs> sort of M cohomology of X um, is an isomorphism. Okay, so let me try to, mm, uh, yeah, so, so in words that says that um, IE uh, X, this condition is saying that X has 
trivial unramified cohomology um, in the most general sense. Um, yeah, so maybe I will pause to contemplate this condition a little bit. <coughs> okay, so I guess, yeah, sorry. So one thing about these conditions, one and two, to understand is that um, it's known that the child group of zero cycles on a smooth, proper, smooth projective variety, um, it's a birational invariant of smooth projective varieties. Um, yeah, so basically, yeah, you can just, in general, there's a formula, if you like, for how the child groups change when you like blow up a subvariety, and that formula just doesn't change the group of uh, zero cycles. So, <clears throat> so somehow, from that, it's clear that these properties one and two are birational invariants of X, and so then, in that sense, it's not so surprising that they're related to unramified cohomology because that's a famous example of a birational invariant. Uh, so let me give some examples of what I mean by unramified cohomology uh, that maybe should be on another board. Let's see. So, so some like specific kinds of unramified cohomology, which are often the only ones you need to think about, um, are the following. Um, yeah, so in short, this is a way to define birational invariants um, say, of smooth projective varieties. Uh, so one case, uh, uh, probably the most important case is that if you're given, um, you know, positive integers uh, um, i and n, you can look at the following invariant um, called unramified cohomology. Uh, look at the, <laughs> the sections of the following sheaf in the Zariski topology um, uh, over x of the sheaf of uh, degree i et al cohomology with coefficients in z mod n of i. Um, um, right. So, okay. So what does this mean? It means you look at, you know, all different uh, Zariski open subsets of x, and for each one of those open subsets, you look at its et al cohomology um, with coefficients in basically z mod n. I mean, technically, z mod n of i in et al cohomology means uh, the group of the sheaf of nth roots of unity tensored with itself i times. <coughs> uh, okay. Um, okay, so there's other ways to, so, so this is, a, you know, a certain, like, i unramified cohomology of x, you could say. Um, this is a, a kind of useful birational invariant. Let me just describe it in different ways. Um, you could also say this is a set of degree i cohomology classes of the Galois group um, of the function field of X, uh, you know, such as Federico has been uh, discussing um, with coefficients in Z mod n of i. So, mm, right, so if I, I guess if I just considered the, the cohomology of the function field of a variety, that would obviously be a birational invariant because it only depends, manifestly only depends on this field, but it wouldn't really be a very useful birational invariant because this group is almost always gigantic. Um, but mm, unramified cohomology is kind of like a small subgroup of this, which is still a birational invariant. The small subgroup is we require that um, the residue um, of u, so there's a residue map that goes from like hi of a field to hi minus one of any codimension one uh, subvariety in there. I guess this is like z mod i n of i minus one. Uh, is zero for every um, codimension one subvariety d and x. Um, right. Okay, so that is that, that explains the name unramified cohomology. Uh, yeah, like like for example, if i was equal to one, then um, does this make sense? Yeah, I guess if i was equal to one, then then by Kummer theory, this would just be the group of uh, non-zero rational functions on x modulo n, and then this condition would be saying we're talking about non-zero rational functions that have no poles at any, uh, along any codimension one, or zeros or poles on any codimension one subvariety. Um, so that would be a pretty boring invariant, but for, for other values of i, this could be more interesting. This must be map uh, similar to the one in the mill not case you mean? Yeah, it is, a, it is the same thing, right, because, uh, yeah, <laughs> it is the same thing as the residue map from mill not here, because you know, by the um, Blockato conjecture, this invariant, uh, this is the same thing as, as I Milner K theory mod, mod n. Yes. <clears throat> okay, so a few quick examples. Uh, maybe it's not visible. Let's see. Let's see. So for 
example, um, the i. Uh, so some examples of these unramified cohomology groups would take, um, uh, you know, the uh, unramified cohomology with coefficients in H1. That's kind of easy to describe for a smooth projective variety. It's just uh, basically H1 with z minus n coefficients. Um, so this is a rational invariant, but it's not a very exciting one. Like, you know, for example, th this, this proves that a, a curve of genus uh, 1 is not birational to a curve of genus 2, because they have different ranks of H1. But you know, there are easier ways uh, to see that. But then the, the next one is sort of um, much more subtle and, and useful. If we look at unramified H2, then that's precisely the end torsion in the Brouwer group um, of this smooth projective variety. And that is, yeah, a, a kind of more subtle and, and therefore um, more useful by rational invariant. <coughs> OK. All right, so I'm in the middle of this statement. So uh, yeah, so, so these birational properties are equivalent to this birational property, and that's equivalent to some other ones, too. Um, so let's see, four. Uh, let's see, where am I writing this? So there is a non-empty Zariski open subset of X mm, such that, let's say like this, um, the Chow groups of this open subset over every extension field, and with coefficients in, in my ring R, uh, are just zero for every field um, um, F over K. So yeah, so this is kind of uh, surprising. Basically, um, this is some, it's like the equivalence between something like one and four is saying that there's some relation between the child group of zero cycles on your variety being kind of small um, overall extension fields. And somehow that's related to child groups in other dimensions being small, um, maybe for just for this open set. So let me, maybe just for some uh, open set. So, so th that, that's a kind of, yeah, I think surprising equivalence. Um, th that's sort of what this trick about decomposing the diagonal is going to do for me. Let, let me just give one example uh, that's related to that. Okay. Um, so let's say consider a surface like um, that's just P1 times a, a curve of genus at least one. Um, P1 maybe times an elliptic curve to be specific. over some field. Okay. Mm. Right. So you might ask, what happens to these um, properties uh, in this case? So then, you know, chow 0 of x um, is what? So uh, yeah, by, by the, we know how to compute chow groups of p1 times any variety. So this is just a sort of silly picture. But here's my elliptic curve. And here's e cross p1. Um, What's the child group of zero cycles on there? It's just the same thing as the child group of zero cycles on the elliptic curve. So this is z plus the group of points on the elliptic curve, k points. And so um, these conditions, like 1 and 2, are, are not true for this variety. Um, so, so x fails conditions, conditions 1 and 2, say. Um, and therefore, it, it should fail all these other properties. But my point is that if you look at open subsets of x, open subsets of x can have kind of a, a very small child group of zero cycles. Um, but look at you know u inside x, the open subset, which is uh, where I remove, uh, like, yeah, remove e cross a point, then the complement is e cross the affine line. Um, right, so that's obviously an open subset of this thing. And, and the point I want to make is that then the child group of zero cycles on this u, I mean, even over every extension field, is just uh, zero. I mean, geometrically, any kind of zero cycle on this open set, you can kind of move it off, <laughs> move it that way, and it just disappears. Um, that would be true for A1 times any variety. Um, but, you know, but you know, this condition was false, so this condition is also supposed to be false. And indeed, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> so let's see what I don't know. Such that this is true. I meant to say this is true for every field f over k and every i less than the dimension um, of our variety here. Sorry, of course, uh, <laughs> the child group of top dimensional cycles would never be trivial. That's always z. But everything else would be um, 0. <coughs> Sorry. Um, 
Yeah, so my point is that condition four, the, uh, the theorem is true, of course, and why is it? And condition four fails in this case because, um, but chow one of u is big. Um, you know, it, it's basically, uh, I think that's right. It's uh, it's the same as it's like the chow zero of the elliptic curve, which is which is kind of non-trivial. Z plus e of k. So yeah. So my point is that it's uh, it's necessary to consider chow groups of different dimensions if you want this kind of equivalence to be true. I hope hope uh, my point got across there. Yeah. So 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 just having an open set whose chow group of zero cycles is small doesn't tell you that the compactification has a small chow group of zero cycles, but if you knew that an open set has small child groups in all degrees, then that would tell you something about um, the compactification. Okay, uh, yeah, so I hope to say at least like enough of the proof to you know, give some idea about how this equivalence goes. <coughs> mm. Yeah, and let's see, maybe I'll do one more equivalence. Um, so, and finally five, um, there's a non-empty open subset of my smooth projective variety uh, open such that, um, let's just say, uh, yeah, so that chow i of u maps uh, with r coefficients, sorry, um, mapping to chow i of u over any bigger field that this is onto, in this case I can say for all i and all fields capital F. So this is you know, vaguely analogous to the equivalence between one and two. Like if there's an open set for which the child groups don't, of that open set don't get any bigger on all extension fields, then actually you know, there's an open set for which the child, those child groups are just uh, zero. <coughs> okay, right, all right. So uh, yeah, uh, you know, there's a lot of equivalences to prove, um, but I wanna prove uh, some of them to give you the idea. Ah, uh, but, uh, sorry, so we're, how much time do I have? Thank you, okay. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, so what do I want to do? So for example, let's start with the proof that one implies two. Um, Okay. All right. So the setup is, yeah. I mean, obviously, two implies one would be obvious. Um, if these groups are all z, then they don't get any bigger when the field increases. But it's it's more subtle that one implies two. So um, that is to say. So let's see. I'll stop writing the coefficients. Um, or you know. So I'm talking about child groups tensored with a fixed ring. Um, <laughs> and I guess sorry. I should have done that here as well. Everything is supposed to be about child groups with coefficients in R, but I'll, I'll just stop writing that. In other words, say, pretend R is the integers. <coughs> okay, so we are assuming um, I have a smooth proper variety over field such that um, chow zero of x mapping to chow zero of x over any extension field is onto <coughs> for every um, field, capital F over k. Okay, and actually, so how am I gonna use that information I'm actually only going to use this for one particular field, which is the function field of x itself. This is a kind of a diagonal trick or something. So use this for f equals, sorry, the function field of x. Okay, and how can I think of that geometrically? Well, the idea is that, um, okay, I can look at x cross x over my field. That has a map to x. I think of this as the first projection, and of course there's also a, a second projection to x. This is over uh, spec k here. Okay. Um, now, uh, yeah. So, so what? Uh, what does kind of x over the function field of x have to do with anything? Well, the idea is that in scheme theory, um, every variety like this uh, x here um, has a, a generic point. Um, you know, people draw a sort of picture like this. There's, a, there's. A, I imagine there's a point here whose closure is all of x. Um, and what that point is, is um, it's the spectrum of the function field of this variety. So like in terms of ring theory, this is just saying you have a ring homomorphism, Im imagine x was affine, you have a ring homomorphism from the ring of functions on x to the field of rational functions on x. The map of schemes goes the other way. 
Okay, so th there is this map of schemes. You could form the fiber product here, um, and, the, um, and what you would get here, the fiber would be exactly x over the function field of x. Okay, so, so this point looks like that point, but you know, they're not the same point. That's the way it goes. Um, okay, yeah, so, so this uh, x over the function field of x, the way I want to think of it, it is, it is the generic fiber of this first projection map. Um, that's, yeah. in, in algebraic geometry, we actually have a generic point. <laughs> okay, and what does the group of zero cycles on uh, x over this function field mean? Well, like, what is the zero-dimensional subvariety of this thing? The answer is there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between, say, zero-dimensional subvarieties uh, here and n-dimensional subvarieties here, like, like this, say. Um, let's say, again, n is the dimension of that variety. So, right, so, um, so how should I think of this? Like, you know, it's like saying um, that sort of this point is it, that, what is that point? It's the generic fiber of this variety over this uh, variety. So in some sense, because the fibers of this map are typically zero dimensional, that's why, you know, if, if you just sort of form the pullback of this thing um, over this with this point, what you'll get is something zero dimensional. So there's this shift in dimension. Um, yeah, just, just somehow because this is like a zero dimensional thing mapping into an n dimensional thing. <coughs> okay, so, right, so what that means is that, uh, I have a natural way, so in other words, um, so in other words, I'm given that in particular, chow zero of x over its original field, k, mapping the chow zero of x over the function field of x is onto. Okay, and the point is that I can now easily write down an interesting element of this chow group here, namely the generic point of a diagonal. Hmm. Draw another picture. So inside x cross x, um, there's an obvious n-dimensional subarray. I mean, there are several ones, but in particular, there is the diagonal. Um, this is first projection, second projection, x. Uh, then there's this generic fiber, x over the function field of x, mapping to um, spec of the function field of x. Right, OK, so, so that n-dimensional subvariety, that uh, you know, its generic fiber over this x here is uh, a zero-dimensional subvariety here. In fact, it's even a, a rational point, right? Because, you know, uh, th th this is not just any subvariety. <laughs> it's a subvariety that has degree one over the base. So that corresponds to, uh, you know, a uh, I'll x in brackets or something, which is a certain k of x rational point uh, in x over this function field. Okay. Right, okay, and so this being onto tells me that that, uh, that point there is, is rationally equivalent to a zero cycle kind of on x, uh, you know, with coefficients in its original field, k, okay? So there is um, a zero cycle alpha on x, meaning <laughs> x over its original field, um, uh, yeah, that, you know, is equal to the class of the diagonal in chow zero of x over this bigger field. Right. So that's what this is telling me. Okay, so yeah, so somehow this, this point is not defined over the little field k, but there's some other um, zero cycle that is, and that's rationally equivalent to this one. Um, and in particular, yeah, from this rational equivalence, um, in particular, alpha is a zero cycle of degree one. Um, because, you know, uh, we're talking about smooth proper varieties, and two, if two, zeros are rash, two zero cycles are rationally equivalent, then they have the same degree, and this one has degree one. <laughs> okay, um, now, what I wanna do is sort of translate, what is this rational equivalence between two zero cycles here? What does that tell me about x cross x? So, um, the fact is that um, the child group of zero cycles on x over this kind of function field could be the function field of some other variety. Maybe it would be clearer to write it that way. But anyway, this is just sort of the direct limit of the n-dimensional child groups of uh, like x cross u, where the limit runs over um, all non-empty open subsets u of x. Um, 
Yeah, so I've kind of like already explained this at the level of, of subvarieties. A zero dimensional subvariety here, uh, here just sort of is, I mean, I guess in scheme theory language, you can just take the closure of that and you get an n dimensional subvariety of x cross x. Um, the kind of subvariety you get, though, is one, it's always one that, that maps onto this variety. So basically, sort of the only difference between uh, this Chow group and, and the Chow group. Chow n of x cross x would be that cycles like this, cycles that are sort of vertical, cycles whose image in here is not dense, those just disappear when you take their generic fiber. So uh, yeah. Because so another way to write this would be that this is Chow n of x cross x modulo the subgroup generated by all uh, sub varieties whose image in this first projection map are are not dense. Um, so all subvarieties of x cross x, n-dimensional subvarieties, whose image under the first projection map are not dense. Um, they map into something, some lower dimension. So, so this kind of subvariety um, kind of disappears when you go to the generic point, but uh, everything else kind of survives. Right, and you know, this is, uh, okay. <laughs> That, that's sort of an obvious thing, this obvious isomorphism just from looking at how things are defined. Okay, so um, what that means is that this, I, you know, I have two interesting rational, uh, two interesting uh, cycles, zero cycles on x cross k of x. By the way, those are both um, generic fibers of certain cycles, certain n-dimensional cycles on x cross x. For the diagonal, I already said that. And alpha is sort of obviously, um, how should I write this? Yeah. Alpha is sort of obviously the generic point of, of this uh, cycle, x cross alpha. So imagine alpha sitting here. Um, yeah. So what this means is that this, this equality in this child group translates to an equality in this child group modulo this kind of error term. Uh, how am I writing this? So, so the diagonal, so in the relevant child group of x cross x, the middle dimensional child group there, um, the diagonal. It's not quite equal to x cross alpha, but it's equal to that plus an error term where uh, b is some cycle, n-dimensional cycle um, on x cross x that's supported in like mm, s cross x for some, is that my notation? For some um, closed subset s, which is not all of x. Okay, so this. These two cycles being zero cycles being equivalent means that this n dimensional cycle is actually equivalent to this one modulo some error term, uh, kind of like this. Um, some some, yeah, some sub variety which which uh, some sum of sub varieties that maps down to lower dimensional stuff on this first copy of x. Okay, and and this this uh, kind of equalities is called a decomposition of the diagonal. Um, One of the big tools in studying child groups by uh, Bloch, uh, Claire Bozan, and many others. <coughs> okay, right. So the idea was that I, I had this condition one. It impl and that, you know, it's a priori is telling me about zero cycles, but actually it's telling me something about you know higher dimensional cycles on x cross x. Okay, and now how to use that? Okay, so I would just have to use the idea of correspondences. I mean, just like draw some pictures quickly to indicate this. So, you know, if you're given any, um, any sub-variety of x cross x, uh, that can be called a correspondence from x to x. Uh, and there's, you, what it does is any sub-variety without writing down details gives you a way to map the child groups here to child groups here. Because what you do is, given a sub-variety here, you look at its inverse image in x cross x, you intersect it with a given sub-variety of x cross x, and then you project over to x, and you get you know something over here. Uh, so, <laughs> sorry for that very quick introduction to correspondences. Um, but uh, yes, but okay. As a correspondence, um, well, the diagonal is a correspondence from x cross x, and the diagonal represents the identity map on Chow groups or you know any other uh, cohomology theory. So the diagonal induces um, the identity. Um, from like chow i of, imagine chow i of this first copy of x to chow i of the second copy of x. 
on for any item. Okay. Um, right, but then that, that implies that, you know, yeah, that, that sort of the way <laughs> the sum of this correspondence plus this correspondence, that also acts as the identity on child groups. Um, and okay, so how do I need to use this? Therefore, oh yeah, yeah, and a good thing, so um, I'm trying to prove something about the way X behaves over on any extension field, and the point is if you have this kind of rational equivalence, these are cycles defined over K, but that just gives you a corresponding uh, equivalence of cycles over any bigger field. Like this cycle determines one over any bigger field, and so does this, and if they're rational equivalent over K, they're rational equivalent over any bigger field. So I can say that for every bigger field, um, uh, let's see how am I writing this, and I'll say this just about zero cycles and every zero cycle beta on x over this bigger field. Let's finish over here. Um, yeah. Okay. Right. So what happens? So the way uh, so beta is equal to um, the way the correspondence delta acts that that I can. Um, acts on beta. That's what I was just saying. The correspondence, the, the diagonal as a correspondence is the identity map on child groups. Um, so again, just to repeat that picture, what is that saying? That's saying you start with a cycle here, beta, you pull it back, x cross x, you intersect it with a diagonal, um, and then project over there to the second copy of x. Hopefully it's obvious that you get the same cycle beta. <coughs> right. Uh, right. Okay, but according to this equality, that's the same thing as the way x cross alpha acts on beta plus the way this sort of error term b acts on beta. Okay, and the good thing is that this thing is zero um, by contemplating this picture. So yeah, beta is a zero cycle here. Um, and this capital B, it's a, a cycle that's just mapping down into some uh, lower dimensional subset of x. So I guess the fact that I want to use is a so-called moving lemma that any a zero cycle on X can be, uh, it, you know, so yeah, so, so if that cycle beta was sort of disjoint from this subset S here, then it would be obvious that um, using the correspondence B for this cycle beta would give you zero. Like B is over here. If I pull back beta and intersect with B, I just get nothing. Um, but the point is that there's a moving lemma that says that every zero cycle can be moved to be disjoint from any uh, proper subvariety of X. So yeah. This because this is because you can arrange beta to be disjoint from the set S, All right? So you just have this, um, but if you contemplate this picture, um, you can see that the way this correspondence x cross alpha acts on beta is also going to be pretty special. Like beta is going to pull back to something there in x cross alpha, and then you're going to project it over to x. What can you get when you do that? <laughs> um, you're going to get a, a zero cycle that's sort of contained in alpha. If you think about it a little bit more carefully you're always going to get just some integer multiple of alpha. So yeah, what you will get is just the degree of beta times alpha. Right, OK. And so what does this mean? We've shown that every zero cycle on x over every extension field is just an integer multiple um, of this one, <laughs> uh, this one zero cycle, um, which was defined over our small field. So, um, so moreover, so basically, yeah, so this if we're using integer coefficients, that just proves that this child group of zero cycles is kind of at most the integers. It's generated by this one element. And moreover, as you recall, we have this degree homomorphism from the child group of zero cycles to the integers, and that takes alpha to one. Okay, so, so this group is generated by sort of one element, alpha, that has degree one, and so um, the child group of zero cycles on this variety is just the integers. Uh, you know. So yeah, and it maps isomorphically by the degree map. So this is QED for one implies two. <laughs> um, okay, so <laughs> I think there's not time to say a lot more about the proofs of the other um, equivalences there. Um, part of this is a result by Mercoriev that th these conditions about having trivial child group of zero cycles are equivalent to having trivial unramified cohomology. Um, yeah, but briefly, like the idea is that to, to relate those things to child groups in other dimensions, uh, maybe for open subsets, the idea is that you can sort of use this kind of condition. It's equivalent to my conditions one, two, and three. You can use this kind of uh, in, 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 more, in more than one direction. 
like this tells you the way I use this in this proof, the way I use this identity in this proof was um, to start with a, an algebraic cycle here, use it the diagonal axis as the identity, and then figure out what these things do to such a cycle. But you can also start with a cycle on this side and sort of you know, use the correspondence backwards. Um, and then you would get some sort of different information from, from this uh, identity. So I think, yeah, without going into details, um, the point is that this identity, it's equivalent to a condition on zero cycles, but it also tells you something about child groups in other dimensions. <laughs> okay, so maybe that's all I would do about the proof of that theorem. And finally, just let me get to using this about classifying spaces. Uh, so time, could somebody? Tell me? Okay, thank you, yeah. So, <clears throat> right, so it's a fact, uh, for example, in my book that um, for like p groups of order um, at most p to the fourth, um, and for um, two groups of order at most 32, um, the child groups are sort of uh, trivial. Um, in the sense that, uh, how do I want to say this? Mm. The child groups uh, G, the child groups of BG over K um, are the same for all fields um, that contain enough roots of unity. Let's say for all fields uh, K of characteristic zero um, that contain, say, the um, order of the group uh, roots of unity. And so, you know, broadly, how do, how do you prove this kind of thing? Um, the idea is that using the kind of isomorphism that I wrote at the beginning about GLN mod G, um, you can sort of reduce studying the whole child ring of a group to just um, the child ring in pretty low degrees, depending on like how big a faithful representation the group has. So for these groups, they, if I remember correctly, they all have a faithful representation of dimension, sometimes P, sometimes P plus one, but at most P plus two. And that's sort of small enough, yeah, that, that you can argue that, um, that, this, that uh, yeah, in, in that range, the child groups are not, uh, not very mysterious. <laughs> um, yeah, so on the other hand, there's the following sort of, that, that this is really sort of sharp, that there are um, some P groups um, of order P to the fifth, if P is odd, um, or of order two to the sixth, 64, um, G such that, um, mm, so it's a bit big. I don't know in which dimension this happens, but for some I, <laughs> um, uh, let's see, and let's say, and I don't know, uh, for every field K of characteristic zero, like maybe K could be the complex numbers, um, there's a bigger field where the child groups <laughs> of that variety get bigger. Um, chow i of bg over k to chow i of bg over this bigger field um, is not subjective. Mm. Uh, right, and in fact, if you sort of like run this argument more than once, so basically you enlarge the field once, you get some more elements in this child group, um, you can show that like there's an even bigger field in which you <laughs> get even more elements, so in fact, um, you know, if you're willing to use weird enough fields, then these child groups can have uh, arbitrarily big cardinality, say. And in particular, they're not gonna be finally generated. Right, so basically once the child groups start increasing, then you can kind of increase them as much as you want if you go to, you know, enormous, ridiculous fields. Okay. Um, right, so yeah, so that's, <laughs> that somehow these, uh, bounds there are really sharp, as it turns out. Um, it would be nice to give you an example of what those groups are, but there's nothing particularly nice about them. They're just some groups of order, whatever, p to the fifth, given by some complicated presentation. Okay, but at least I wanna discuss how this kind of thing goes. Um, so proof sketch is like, um, so you know these groups, these sort of weird groups for this purpose. I should say, by the way, that there are, there are some groups finding groups like arbitrarily big, 
for which the child groups are quite nice, like, like this. Uh, maybe we're, you know, for example, for abelian groups, as I mentioned, but also for groups like the symmetric groups, uh, Sn for any n, this kind of property holds. Um, in fact, that the Chow ring of the symmetric group is, is just generated by uh, not quite Chern class of representations, but transfers of Chern classes of representations from, uh, from subgroups. So yeah, so for a lot of groups, there's kind of a nice algebraic description of the Chow ring that doesn't really depend on the phase field, but then there are just some weird groups for which that fails. Um, so what's the source of these groups? It's by Bogomolov, Saltman, and others. Um, I should write down Hoshi, Ken Kunyevsky. Um, um, so they showed that there are some groups of these orders. Um, there are um, groups G as above, so order P to the fifth if P is odd, or two to the sixth, um, such that, let's say it like this, uh, for any faithful representation of those groups, um, v of those groups, um, let's say over, over C, uh, yeah, let's say over C to be specific, um, the, the um, Brouwer group of a, a smooth compactification of V mod G, or yeah, maybe I want to say um, of U mod G, so uh, then this, this group is, is sort of not uh, trivial. Um, where I guess I should say, you know, U is an open set of V mod S, like in my proof, where G acts um, freely on, on this open set. Right. So, um, yeah, so, so the way they thought of this is, I mean, so there's a, a version of uh, Noether's problem, as it's called, which is just to say, if you're given a finite group act and a complex representation of that, is the quotient variety vector space mod the group always a rational variety? Um, you know, it, it doesn't look like anything like an elliptic curve, so you might think maybe it should be a rational variety, but, but this, this calculation shows that it's not, at least for some somewhat complicated um, finite groups. Okay, but the point is that like, you know, this is a kind of unramified cohomology group, and um, you know, and so the, the theorem that I wrote there, <laughs> skipping many steps, um, tells you that, you know, if you have a, an, like an open variety like this that has, you know, whose smooth compactification has non-trivial unramified cohomology, then um, this open part, it's got to have sort of complicated child groups. So that implies that sort of there is some number i. You don't know which, because I didn't really go through the details, but because of the way the argument works, you don't quite know which this number is, but there's some number i such that the child groups of this kind of uh, approximation variety to PG uh, increase when you increase the field. This is not surjective for some field um, capital F. Okay, um, and maybe let me just, uh, maybe a, as a conclusion to get from this to a statement about VG, let me look at where we are. I mean, yeah, so this I hope it's clear this is sort of most of the way towards uh, that, but to be a little bit more specific, let's say. Um, okay, so note, um, so let's see, how do I wanna say this? So uh, here we have a sort of puzzling thing because of the <laughs> sort of indirect argument that I, yeah, discussed a bit earlier. Um, I don't know what this number i is. Um, so, so like if this number i were not too big, then I would know that this chow group of u mod g, that would just be the same thing as chow i of bg. But uh, somehow I don't know what this number is, and so I don't a priori know that this chow group is the same as some chow group of bg. Um, so what can I do? So the thing to realize is that um, I want to sort of consider the localization sequence of equivariant chow groups. Um, for like, um, uh, for the inclusion of S into V, okay, in the situation where G is, you know, V is a particular representation of G, S is a subset where G acts freely on the complement. Um, so one thing that tells me is that the equivariant Chow ring of V maps onto 
the equivariant Chow ring of B mod S. That's just a, sort of the right part of the, um, of the localization sequence. Um, OK, but this thing, by homotopy invariance for Chow groups, this is Chow I of BG. I mean, a vector space. <laughs> so this is like a, the Chow groups of a vector bundle over BG. That's just the same thing as the Chow groups of BG itself. Um, and this is the Chow groups of, um, of like in my notation, uh, U mod G. Right. Oh, uh, yeah. And I could like draw a commutative diagram where I consider, so I have this map is onto, um, I could also consider the corresponding things over any extension field, uh, capital F of K. Yeah, I didn't maybe, <laughs> I didn't really spell this out, but somehow like part of the, the philosophy of motives is that you shouldn't just study varieties over one field, you should think about how they behave uh, under all extension fields. Um, right, so you'll have this kind of commutative diagram but this is also subjective. Um, right, and so how should I put this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so like, you know, if, if this map were going to be um, subjective for every uh, field capital F over K, then I guess this composition would also be subjective. So, so this composition would be subjective. Yes, okay, and that would imply that, that this map here was subjective. Okay, but, okay. But we know, so, so you know, no matter what this number I is, um, we know that the, this guy is not surjective, so yeah, if you just think through it formally, that implies that, um, that this map is not surjective. Um, okay. Okay, and that's um, the end of this proof of theorem. Um, okay. So yeah, it's a bit puzzling because like, um, if you ask yourself, like, what are these fields for which this is happening? I mean, basically the proof would tell you they're, they're function fields of some <laughs> varieties that come up. Uh, maybe function fields of this variety or function fields of sub-varieties of that. You have to sort of look at the proof, but, um, but you don't get a very explicit description of what these fields are. Uh, anyway, that's why I have. Thanks.